Hello, people. Uh, we're looking forward to doing this show. And we just did a show on uh, the murder of Bruiser Brody. And um, we had uh, over 5,000 views so far. So very surprised by that. We picked up 100 new subs. Thank you, whoever joined. And today we're going to talk about the double murder suicide of Chris Benoit. And I know this has been out there many times, but James and I uh, are going to um, pretty much give our perspective and what our opinions are. You know, there's a lot of different opinions on this, James. And just yeah. so you know, this will be the Lee Cole, James Proctor wrestling podcast. And because we're doing this together as partners, and um, I'm glad to have a partner like James because he saves me a lot of work. <laughs> James, how you doing, my man? Hey, doing great, and uh, thank you for allowing me here. Look forward to the discussion. And, and you know, we, we're doing a show not because we're trying to come in here as experts. We're trying to come in here to give our perspective because this whole thing with Chris ben, uh, Benoit, would you say? Is, would, yeah, Benoit. Well, with Chris Benoit was uh, a tragic thing, but I always said it was his fault, no excuse, and then – James, I did a lot of research into it. Yeah. And I and, and, and I kind of changed my mind on that. And I'm going to explain why. What okay. do you think, James, about this whole thing with the murder or suicide? Well, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I believe a, a person is responsible for his or her decisions. Uh, and, you know, but I do believe that, you know, there were a lot of factors that led to it, you know, the CTE obviously did, uh, you know, alcohol and substance abuse played a part, maybe steroids as well, but there was some deliberation to this, to the two murders, right? So, I mean, it occurred over a three day period. So it was there, you know, it wasn't something sudden. And right. so, so I kind of think that, you know, I still have to lay the blame at um, Chris's feet on this. And we're going to talk about his brain, how damage you, at death, he had the brain of an 85 year old man. That's how much brain yeah. damage he had. Uh, and from concussions, I mean, he was famous for coming off the ropes uh, with yep. his headbutt. I mean, yep. that was his move right there, the headbutt. He would come down on his head continuously. And that was it. And, you know, you got to give the, this guy was some, he was somewhat of a underdog because he was a very small guy, James. Yeah. And and the fact that he got to the point of, of the size he did, of course, that had a lot to do with steroids. Right. Uh, but this whole thing started from the beginning. Uh, let's explain. Uh, this is what happened. No, uh, where did Chris Benoit start wrestling? Yeah. So he he actually uh, started in Canada. If you remember, we talked about the. Uh, the Von Erichs and Fritz Von Erich, how he started in with Stu Hart and the, you know, up in Calgary with the uh, Stampede uh, wrestling. And that's exactly where uh, uh, Chris Benoit started as well. And he was a and the Hart much... family still had the, uh, you know, they still were there and were doing the, you know, the training and of wrestlers. And he was a much smaller man when he first started out wrestling than how he ended up. Uh, exactly. He was always pretty short. He was 5'11". I mean, that's normal uh, height for a, you know, for a, an American male. But, you know, in the world of wrestling, especially in that age, it was, you know, the bigger, the better, the taller, the better. So anytime you were, you know, less than 6'3", 6'4", and, you know, 250 pounds, you were considered uh, small. And, and what he did is he took his small frame that you usually would become tag teams, which he was parts of tag teams. Sure. But he became his own show also. He became a person that people wanted to see on his own, which is very unusual for a smaller wrestler. Exactly. Uh, now, he met... Uh, Let's talk about how did he meet his wife? There was a lot of uh, issues on the way he met his wife. Mm -hmm. His wife was married to another very famous wrestler and steroid user, Kevin Sullivan. Yep. And so how did he start uh, hooking up with Kevin Sullivan's wife, would you say? Yeah, so the wife's name was Nancy. She went by 
woman. She, you know, she had other, she had other names as well. Fallen Angel, um, several others. Devil Persona. Angel, Para, Robin Green. You yeah. Know, and, yeah. And she started her, in 1984, just so people know. Now, we'll, I'm sorry to cut you off there. No, First, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, she wrestled or she was uh, involved for, you know, 12, 13 years herself. And, and so there was an angle with uh, Kevin Sullivan. So he was a promoter for WCW. This was probably around 1999 or so. And so uh, Chris was with the WCW actually for the second time. And so it was just a, um, an angle. It was an angle wrestling angle where they would have a, an on-screen relationship. And, you know, they showed them holding hands, uh, supposedly staying in the same hotel room, all of that. But then it ended up that this on-screen relationship actually, uh, you know, got consummated into, a, into an affair. So here they're having an affair. Mm -hmm. uh, in the beginning, uh, Sullivan didn't expect it, and then he slowly nope. started suspecting it. And it seems like a lot of people knew about the affair before Kevin Sullivan. Yeah. You, you know, it, it, it was the gossip all around the arenas. Yeah. And uh, Kevin Sullivan didn't want to believe it. Right. So what was his reaction when he found out? Well, yeah, I mean, he was, he was definitely angry about it. Um, you know, my understanding is there were some arguments um, actually between the two that might have uh, actually actually got physical during a match or at the end of a match. And uh, the other thing I heard that was interesting, though, with uh, Kevin Sullivan, uh, at least, you know, the tales from the ring, dark side from the ring, I mean, uh, they mentioned that there was some domestic abuse. So Kevin, I guess, was had been, um, you know, committing, uh, a, you know, what do you call it, battery or assault on his wife. And, you know, she left him and, you know, went with, went to Chris. Yeah. And in the beginning, I guess her relationship was pretty solid with Chris Benoit. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and this was... At this time, he had just started taking steroids where you could notice it, Chris. Benoit. Right. Because he went from a small guy, all of a sudden he started bulking up and getting very big. Right. And, uh, so she left uh, she, she left Kevin Sullivan and she married Chris Benoit. Yeah. And uh, once she did that, her life was different, uh, but she decided to leave wrestling. Right. And, uh, she, and when she got married, she left mm -hmm. wrestling and she um, wanted to start a family. Yeah. And take it from there, my man. Yeah. So, you know, like you said, they, they got married. And so, you know, Chris had been uh, married before. And with his first wife, he had a son, David. And so uh, David, I guess, was probably born in, I don't know the exact year, but I uh, believe in the late 90s so it happened uh around the time before uh, well, she, gave, she gave birth to him in february of 2000. oh okay yeah that makes sense and, and she then, married and she married chris the same year and mm -hmm. that was uh on the 23rd uh in november 23rd in the year 2000. okay yeah but i knew that uh and so david was the first son from chris's first wife and then daniel is a son that they had together so that Chris and uh, Nancy had together. So Daniel was the, the boy that was tragically, you know, killed by his father. And, and she was managing uh, her husband's career from mm -hmm. home. And yeah. uh, she was pretty much a manager slash wife slash right. mother, but they mm -hmm. started having a lot of issues. Yeah. Uh, and, and a, a lot of abusive issues. Yes. Uh, and what would you think uh, led to that? Well, I mean, you know, I think part of it was obviously, you know, the there was the the issues from the CTE. You know, one of the things about CTE, I know we'll probably go into more detail later. It's kind of difficult to 
you can't really diagnose it until a person has died. But, you know, it was obvious that he was going through that also. Uh, there was a lot of arguments about steroids because there were some texts where uh, Nancy's basically saying that uh, he's, you know, she's tired of the, of the roid rage. And then, in fact, in 2003, they, I think she filed for divorce from him and they uh, got back together. Yes, and she even filed an order of protection. Um, yeah. She had some concerns because he was very violent. Yes. And, uh, and but she, like a lot of women do, and mm -hmm. this is a very common practice, women want to give it another chance, second chance, third chance. Sure. And so she did. Yeah, she did. And it seemed like that if there was a catalyst on, on what, you know, what may have caused some of this was the... You know, Chris was best friends. He had two good friends and, you know, with the WCW at the time. And in fact, uh, one was was Eddie Guerrero. And Eddie Guerrero died in 2005. Yes. And, and so, you know, he got, you know, Chris was always this non-emotional type guy. You know, he had that persona in the ring and and personally and he really took that death hard you know if if you remember eddie was found dead in his uh hotel room yes and, and it was uh basically he had um heart failure you know and so, it was would the drugs have something to do with that yeah he had a lot of of drug and specifically alcohol issues and you know he had you know tried to turn his life around. I know he was a, a strong Christian as well. I think you'll see with Chris that at the, at the end, you know, they find, they find Bibles around the murder scene right. and everything. And so uh, Guerrero was definitely a, a Christian and had led um, Chris to, to God, I guess. And the problem being, you can lead someone to God, but if they're suffering concussions and if they're suffering, yeah. suffering steroid rage, we're talking so many things going on in the individual's life. Yes, and, exactly. You know, and then on top of that, you're working for the W, uh, W, I'm sorry, WWE, who, yes, exactly, has a habit of not really caring about their workers. They call them independent contractors. Uh, yeah, exactly. And that's what happened with, um, so one of the things, you know, we were talking about in 2000 where uh, Chris had married um, Nancy. And one of the other things that happened that year was that Chris left the, you know, he's with the WCW. Right. And, and so him and Chris Jericho and I believe, uh, um, Eddie Guerrero, they all left uh, WCW at the same time and went to work for WWF. And to give you an idea how big this man started getting, look at him here. This is here, you know, he's starting, you know, he's still, he's starting to get big there. But then look at this picture. I mean, <laughs> all of a sudden you see a, a, a growth on him that's incredible yeah, we, we can't put this all at the doorstep of WWE because he was doing this before he got to the WWE. All right. right. But once you get to the WWE, if the owner's doing it, everybody's doing it. And, yes. you know, um, my brother gave some testimony on the steroid use and stuff. And mm -hmm. uh, there's quite a bit of issues on that. Um, but we'll save that for another show. Okay. Uh, okay. And okay. So you got this man now. He's having all these rages. Yeah. He's terrorizing his wife. He's on the road all the time. Yeah. Uh, he gets home. He's exhausted. You know, he's exhausted. The, the man's suffering from concussions. And this is the thing about the WWE or any wrestling organizations that have always treated their workers like go in there, kill your body. Yeah. Tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And so this is a man that would have concussions and never really get rid of them, would he? No. No, I mean, they, and that's, that's part of this idea, you know, they're independent contractors and if they, and, you know, the promoters have all the say. So one of the problems is, 
if you call in sick, you might not ever get back in the ring. You know, they may just let you go. If, yeah, so, if you call in sick, that means you ruin a card. You yeah, exactly. A card that's been advertised for two months. Yeah, and he wasn't one about um, missing a card. He, you know, he was always, uh, he always showed up for his matches. He was always early. And, you know, and that's what we'll find out as we go into what happened on, you know, June 23rd, 2007, some of the unusual um, well, things start, that were happening. Yeah. And we'll get to that because, um, yeah, this is when everything uh, really fell apart. And the way the WWE handled it was pretty sad. And we'll talk about that too. We'll talk about the way Jerry McDivitt kind of uh, protected his organization because he was afraid of war right. troops coming down on him. Uh, right. Like they always are. Okay, so you got this. Okay, so what? Describe the day of uh, when he started. He he went missing on the twenty third. Describe yeah that day up until the twenty fifth. Uh, right. Yeah. So you know it was kind of strange. So uh, this started on a Saturday um, about three thirty p.m. Uh, I get so Chavo Guerrero was a, you know, a friend of, of Chris's received a voicemail message from Chris and, and Chris was saying that, that Nancy and Daniel had food poisoning. And so there was supposed to be a match later that night in Beaumont, Texas. And so they said that, you know, he was saying, well, I'm, you know, going to be late to the match. And so Guerrero uh, called him back and, you know, in that conversation with Chris, you know, Chris didn't seem right. He, he sounded, you know, tired. He sounded uh, just wasn't himself. And so anyway, uh, when Guerrero tried to call him back again, uh, Benoit didn't answer the, the call. And so basically just wanted to see if he was okay. And so anyway, uh, you know, Benoit did call him back saying that he was on the phone with Delta trying to get a flight to come to the match. And so, you know, Guerrero just said, well, I'm here for you. If you need anything, just let me know. And so one of the things that was a little weird about it was that uh, Chris said to Chavo, um, Chavo, I love you. You know, he said it in a way that just was odd. And so, and so by this time, he's yeah. already take, he's already murdered his wife and son. Oh yeah, yeah, he had already done that. And we're talking so so we're on the twenty uh, we're on the twenty third where this whole mm -hmm. thing starts. Now we're getting up to the twenty fifth, and so yeah. they're wondering where he is. And they they basically called the police department. And yeah, they sent someone over here to find out what's going on. He was in the suburbs of Atlanta, right? Uh, and. Uh, so describe to me what happened when the, um, they did the welfare check. Yeah, so one of the things that did happen just on Sunday, the 24th, which was kind of unusual, there were some text messages that that were sent to, uh, I think, to Chavo and, and maybe Chris Jericho. But basically it was the same message from both Chris's phone and from Nancy's phone to them. And so basically it was saying something about the – a gate was left open and but the dogs are there saying so it was just very unusual and it was in the middle of the night. And so anyway, uh, you know, the Guerrero, you know, he didn't get the message, I think, till the next morning or whatever. And so Guerrero was actually supposed to pick up um, Chris from the airport and he didn't show up. And that was in Corpus Christi, I believe. They were supposed to have a show there. Right, uh, exactly. And and when these wrestlers don't show up, it changes the whole show. It becomes a, a, an urgent matter. Uh, so right, exactly. But he actually, on Sunday morning, and so this is where I'm, I'm thinking that some of this was, you know, there was some planning involved in this murder because he actually called the WWE office um, – saying his son was vomiting, you know, saying that he and his wife were at the hospital with him and then said that he would take a later flight, uh, you know, to 
to come to the match, but you know, as we know, he failed to show up. So, you and, know, that was strange. And then uh, when they contact the Fayetteville Georgia police, mm -hmm. uh, that's when they discovered the body. Uh, yeah. Explain how the murder went, what, what they were saying, what, exactly what Chris Benoit did and how, how the murder went down. The murder sure. Went down. So, right. So uh, what they said uh, first that happened was that he killed uh, Nancy first. And so what they could tell from the autopsy on Nancy was that he had, he had her on the ground. He had his, um, his knee in her back and he wrapped a cord around her neck and strangled her and, and may have actually broke her neck. I, I'm not for certain on that, but basically it was a, you know, very painful uh, death. And so that was the first murder. And then Later, he, his son, Daniel, he gives him Xanax, you know, saying like 100 milligrams of Xanax, which, you know, basically knocked him out. You know, the kid's seven years old or whatever, and, you know, gave him, you know, a, more than what's used for a, a full grown man. And so, so then he strangled um, his, his son as well. And 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 the thing that was when you think about the fact that he gave him Xanax, yeah, that means this was a premeditated murder. Uh, yeah, that's the word I was trying to use. It, it seemed like it, it was premeditated, and so that's why I was was that was the word I was trying to find. You know, it, it makes you wonder what was in his head in the very end because are the last few days. Uh, yeah, no one's gonna ever know. But did this man know he was gonna go home? Did he get into an argument with his wife when he got home? I right. mean, something. Did she tell him, "I'm leaving you. I can't do this no more." These right. are things that we'll never know, huh? Right. And and some of the other evidence that was premeditated was that he there were two. He was on his computer, and they found a couple of search queries. One was he was uh, looking up uh, the believe in the Bible, the Old Testament, there's the prophet Elijah that I guess had raised a, a, a kid from the from dead in Bible times. And so, you know, he was looking, I guess, a uh, way to, uh, you know, he must have known his son. He had probably already killed his son at that time, was seeing if there's a way to revive him. And then uh, the second one was, uh, what's the quickest way and most painless the least painful way to break your neck. So that was the second one. You know, it's uh, pretty amazing when you think about it. He's worried about what pain he's going to go through. And he just, yeah. uh, can you imagine the pain that his wife went through when he murdered? Oh, gosh. Him? You know, uh, sure, he didn't uh, brutalize his son in that vicious murder. He yeah, thank goodness on that. Uh, but it, it's, it's still a horrible thing. Oh, yeah. uh, very horrible. I mean, it's his family. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, he had another son, am I correct? And I, look, people, I'm just going to let you know, I'm not going to put up any pictures of his other son because his other son's alive and it just wouldn't be the right thing to do. So he did have an older son that looks mm -hmm. just like him pretty much, right? Yeah, that's what amazed me when I saw David. He just looked just like him, you know. And how did, yeah. what, does, what does David say about the murders? Yeah, it really hurt. It, it hurt him a lot. And so there was a, if you look at the uh, dark side of the ring, there was a, there was a lot of interviews of David in that. And so he was, I mean, he's still devastated. I mean, when they did, I guess this, this interview, that series was from 2019 maybe. And so, you, you know, he was saying that his father was, yeah, he had a lot of love and respect for his father. And so he, he, you know, really loved his dad and he misses his dad. And, and so he's definitely devastated by it. And Benoit had two children, two other children then, you know, from his first marriage, I believe. Right. Yeah. Total of three, I believe. So, yeah. So, and uh, they sent a lot of the belongings to that family after he died. Um, right, and there wind up being a cremate, they, they, a cremation. Um, mm -hmm. 
of, I guess everybody was cremated. Right. Um, but this is when Jerry McDivitt moved in. And uh, we all know Jerry McDivitt. I know Jerry McDivitt. Jerry McDivitt. Um, he is who he is. Uh, he's done a lot of damage to my family. Right. He did a lot of damage to my brother. Mm. But here is uh, Jerry McDivitt as we know him. He's been... Now let's let's remember. I rem I met Jerry McDivitt in 1992, and here we are, all these years later, and he's still the house counsel for the WWE. Uh, Jerry McDivitt has kept them out of many many situations that's happened. Uh, and anything that we talk about that's happened since 1992, or, or be before then, Jerry McDivitt has been there to help cover it up. Right. Now, now this murder isn't a cover up of the murder. But I, you know, it's amazing when you're at this time you're a billion dollar corporation. Mm -hmm. You know what you're you're you know what's going on through all your uh, uh, all your workers. You know the damage they're doing to their body. Right. Uh, do you think it was pretty well known that uh, he was suffering these concussions throughout the organization at that time? Oh, I'm I'm sure they know that. You know, I mean, I mean everything about. WWE is one is choreographed. They know what's happening. They're so protective of their brand and image, everything they know, you know, so they might not know. They they'll know when a wrestler has a concussion. They yeah. Can tell. And, and, you know, here's, here's where Vince McMahon, McMahon was very smart. He, uh, he wanted to not be, uh, he didn't want to have to deal with any of the sports, in the state regulations and rules. So right. what he did is he named his company an entertainment company. Right. And that stopped a lot of things that if he was, if he, if they stayed the W the WWF name was bought out and mm -hmm. uh, not bought out. I'm sorry. It was in a lawsuit. They lost the first name. Yeah. Uh, and then they became the w, from the WWF to the WWE, but he called it entertainment. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people think everything is entertainment, whether it's a murder that's real right. or situations like this. But the first thing Jerry McDivitt did after the murder was come out and say, well, it may have been caused from some medication he was taking from taking steroids. And he was uh, having he was missing. a, a, a He had trouble with his. Uh, uh, well, how do you say best? A testicular. Issue. Oh, yeah. Tes yeah. The te low testosterone or whatever. Right. Need the I testosterone replacement therapy or whatever. And that's basically the statement that was made by Jerry McDivitt. Uh, and then if anybody came up with any other things all over after that, Jerry McDivitt would say, well, you know, that can't be proven. Uh, we don't think that's it. But, you know, you have these workers in your in your corporation that are all suffering like this. Yeah. And to this day, there seems to be nothing being done about it, James. Mm -mm. No, in fact, um you know, there was law, there was a group of wrestlers, I think it's about a several dozen wrestlers filed a lawsuit against the WWE and actually Vince McMahon personally uh, for you know CTE, the concussions and all of that. And you know, the WWE was able to uh, prevail in the lawsuits by getting the case dismissed, and it was based on technicality of of the uh, statute of limitations had expired. And so they say it was too long in the past, too far along in the past. And so the, there were lawsuits. They even tried to appeal it. The appeal went against the wrestlers and Supreme court said, Hey, we're not going to hear the case. And especially when you have your wife, who's a politician, mm -hmm. uh, she's even in the cabinet in Trump's cabinet at one time. Yeah, I mean, people underestimate the power of Vince McMahon. Right, uh, we never did. Me, my, my family never did. Right. Uh, but the, the fact of the matter is that Vince McMahon's a very powerful man with an exceptionally good lawyer. And yeah, and that's that. I think that's really what they do. They they're bulldogs when it comes to their um, image, their brand. You know, everything's about the brand, right? And so yes, everything's about the brand and. Look at the things they've gotten away with forever now uh, under the, well, not anymore. It seems like Vince McMahon's out, but 
yeah. all the damage he did with that corporation over the, the decades that he was in there. But let's give you an example. We're going to pull up the autopsy report, and then we're going to show you what his brain looked like. Yeah. Okay? And and to give you an idea, well, here's the autopsy report right here. Okay, add the stream. Okay. Okay, so basically this is dated from 6-26-2007. This is uh, the day after the murders. Uh, okay, one second, please. They Okay, so basically they pretty much... Uh, they said his final di di diagnosis was hanging with uh, ligature, but here's how, here's how this guy really, how, how this guy really, you knew this was premeditated. He literally put something around the thing going around his neck. So it wouldn't dig into his neck. You know, he put a, uh, uh, the ligature was covered with a soft uh, protection. So, and that was, very, and you don't usually have people do that when they commit suicide. Right. They just, you know, and, you know, unfortunately, my family had a hanging suicide, my brother Tom, mm. and yeah. it was nothing like that, unfortunately. This guy, mm. he was so worried about how he was going to die, how much pain he was going to be in. This is where his head was at in the end. Yeah. That's interesting, the testicular atrophy. That's, that's usually a result of, of, of abuse of steroids. Yes. And basically you, as you get too much st um, testosterone, then the body starts generating estrogen. And so that's usually, that's, it's a balance of testosterone. And then you want to be able to uh, prevent the estrogen from building up. So they want to mask the estrogen. So that's interesting, this testicular atrophy. I didn't notice that yes. before. And, and then he had the post-cervical spine fusion. All these wrestlers have spine fusion, neck oh, fusion. Yeah. It's part mm -hmm. of the game. And yeah. they considered it suicide, self-hang. And uh, the body was well-developed, well-nourished, 5'11", 224, white skin, appearance is consistent with that of given of an age of a 40-year-old man. The scalp mm -hmm. hair is fine, up to three inches with frontal baldness. There is a quarter inch uh, between the butt mustache and the beard. The eyes had uh, blue irids, comet, camias. I'm sorry, I'm not a doctor. Yeah, that, that's basically the cornea and the iris were blue and was. Which blue. is common with hanging. Yeah. Uh, the oil, the, his uh, oral uh, captivity of the natural teeth and good repair. Mm -hmm. So uh, the nose and facial uh, bones were intact. Yeah. No scars or basically, um, and I'm just going to go over this. The torso is unremarkable. The external gentilia uh, are atraumatic and of normal circumstances for an uh, circumcised for an adult. Right. Mm -hmm. There are no tattoos. That's, That's interesting new. there. You don't see that anymore. Everyone's no. got tattoos now. He had multiple small scars on his knuckles. Mm -hmm. Uh there was no rigor mortis. Livity is fixed, purple, and chest abandoned. Uh, clothing, personal effects, they had all of that. Uh, he basically had on a pair of sneakers, socks, and shorts. That, that's what he had on. Yeah, he still had his, um, had his wedding ring on, it showed. The ligature completely surrounds the neck. It ranges from a quarter inch to a half inch at the front of the neck. It goes horizontal and measures a half an inch in width. Uh, there are three quarter inch in diameter dried abrasions on the uh, interior neck. Around the neck is a single loop 70 inch rope, uh, long rope, they basically say. But listen to this. Underneath the black rope ligature is a one, a three and a half inch, 24 inch white towel, which is wrapped around the neck twice and taped to itself. So this man taped the towel around his neck before he hung himself. Yeah. And that's what I meant by he was protecting his neck. Uh, that's you know, interesting that, so he just hung himself because it didn't even fracture his neck. That's interesting. Uh, so basically after that, I'm not gonna, everything was basic. it was pretty much normal in his part, uh, in his body, except the testicular uh, issues, mm -hmm. which showed that he was, uh, pretty much into steroids. That's uh, 
and uh, the brain. Now, this is before the brain was examined. Unremarkable. Right. Heart, there is a, a myocyte hypertrophy, whatever that means. Maybe you know. Yeah, the uh, basically, um, yeah, I think it's, it was a little bit enlarged, I believe, is what that means. There is a moderate congestion and patchy slight uh, inter interstitial fit god almighty me and i can't pronounce names let alone oh, I can't names. Do that. <laughs> okay so i'm gonna give up under the they had photographs and here's the final the 40 year old man chris mermois died results of hanging self after reviews of scenes photographs discussions with investigation the autopsy finding the decent uh descendant hanged himself using a rope from his exercise machine the ligature furrow around his neck in conjunction with no other significant drama supports the matter of death as being suicidal. So people that make this, there's these silly rumors about Kevin Sullivan being involved in the murder. No, this yeah. is a crazy man that hung himself and killed his family. You know, it's, uh, this ain't wrestling people. This is a, this is a murder. This isn't like uh, Kevin Sullivan sneaking through the window and taking out the family. <laughs> right. Yeah. You've heard those stories, right? That mm -hmm. he's involved and all this crap. And oh yeah. So okay, I just wanted you to see that. Okay, and uh, that's your typical autopsy report. But afterwards, they checked the brain out. Let's explain to him what did they find in Benoit's brain. Yeah. So the advance. <clears throat> excuse me. I'm had kind of a tick on my throat. So anyway, the, so the, yeah, so the advanced CTE, what it's showing is that uh, it's basically a protein buildup. And so when that protein uh, starts, it's a result of the concussions, you know, it's kind of like scar tissue in a way in the brain. And so, yep, you see that. So you see the difference in color there between healthy brain tissue and then uh, Chris's. And so the issue with that is that as you have that swelling, as you have the protein buildup, it affects areas of the brain that's responsible for emotions, responsible for like control. And so, you know, it really can affect uh, memory as well. And so think of a person that's um, got Alzheimer's or someone that's you know, that's got dementia that's in their 80s. You know, that's what they similar. said. His brain, he had the brain of between 80 and 85 year old man. Yeah. How could you, how can a man going through what he's going through at and being at the athletic level he's at function? Right. With an 85 year old brain. You know, yeah. when my brother committed suicide, uh, we all wondered in the last year of his life, he traumatically changed. Mm -hmm. um, nobody knew, but when they did an autopsy on my brother, Tom, they found a tumor. Oh, okay. And they found a tumor in the lobe part of the brain. So yeah, anything in his past that was emotional was controlling the way he thinks. Exactly. And the day I talked to him, uh, right after we got off the phone, he hung himself and Mm. The, the fact of the matter is that my brother knew what he was going to do. We had a great conversation. There was no arguing, nothing. Wow. He had made up his mind what he was going to do. And he did not know he had that brain tumor. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the autopsy was done on him, uh, they pretty much said that he was going to die within a year to two years because it, was, it, it had spread to other parts of the brain. Oh, wow. Um, so it made his daughters feel better. Mm -hmm. Knowing that their father just didn't go nuts that overnight, you know, he mm -hmm. had something in his brain that was controlling the way he thinks. Right. I, I like to know, uh, besides these concussions and stuff, isn't it unbelievable to think that this man was literally walking around and still functioning at that time? Yeah, that's what's that's what's uh, amazing to me. I, I know it also causes uh, depression as well and anger and all of that. And so... Yeah, I don't know how they could, how they're able to function, you know. Well, this is a man that, he was a great wrestler, I mean, but toward the end of his life, if you watched him on TV, it seemed like he never smiled. After right. Guerrero died, he definitely mm -hmm. never smiled. No. Uh, he went to the ring, he didn't, 
you could see that he wasn't the same person, just like with right. my brother, we could see that he wasn't the same person anymore. Right. Um, so he has this brain issue. Um, and then he goes home and it costs his family their lives. And uh, I guess that he just wanted to take them out with him and go and, and leave this earth when you think about it. Huh? Yeah, I mean, I know that he had uh, kept kind of a diary. That was like a, one of the things that happened after Eddie died was that he, I don't know if he went to a counselor, but it might have just been something talking with Nancy, but basically they said, Hey, why don't you write a, keep a journal or keep something when, you, you know, if you've got words that you want to remember Eddie with. And I think in one of the comments that he wrote, he, he said, you know, I'll be coming home soon saying, you know, he's basically going to die soon and be, you know, with Eddie. And so, you know, there's a, it at least been a few years that, he had a dark um, mindset. Very dark. And yeah. uh, and with darkness, the tragedy took it that much further. Yeah, and, exactly. You know, with, and, and when he died, and you are right, he did not snap the neck or anything. He literally died of strangulation. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess it probably took him a little bit to die. He had a very big neck. Yeah. Uh, so he made that, you know, he, that effort to kill himself by choking himself to death. Yes. And the suicide note was, wasn't discovered at the scene, but they did find it uh, in a Bible, but it was very, right. very short, not really much of anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it didn't really explain why he was killing them, did it? No, it didn't. And so, you know, it, you know, usually it's a culmination of, of things and, but we don't know what the catalyst was. You know, my understanding was there, the fan, there was some arguing that occurred. Uh, and I guess one of the neighbors uh, is also in WWE. I can't recall who it was, but uh, knew that there was some problems. And I know that the sister of Nancy knew there were issues and, and she felt, like she, I guess, had helped to bring Nancy and Chris together when they were um, separated for a while. I think that basically, you know, the legal thing where he wasn't allowed around. And so, you know, she regrets ever, you know, intervening for in Chris's behalf to to have him go back to Nancy. And of course, the WWE, knowing that what happened uh had a big show the night mm -hmm. uh, i believe the night after his death after yeah his exactly recovery, which was really really it was horrible you know and and then they started wiping him from the history of the wwe but lately you've been seeing stuff around again haven't you yeah i mean i've seen a, a few things around um i know that there's a couple other hall of fames that he's still in i think the the stampede um uh, hall of fame he might still be in and then there was a a, a publication a pro wrestling publication where actually they voted to keep him in and so yeah i think as time has went by you're you know it's been what 15 years you've you're starting to see uh him at least being mentioned at times and in the wwe encyclopedia they have him listed up until the time that he lost the world heavyweight title to randy orton and hmm. uh then he disappears <laughs> you know wow. so uh it's amazing what you could do and uh but you know it's a very sad story and i hope that we shared it with people the best we can yeah. we're not here trying to be experts we're just trying to give you our take on it. It's yeah. a very really sad story. And uh, James, how would you like to finish this off? No, I mean, it was, it was definitely a tragedy. I I just, I think that the there's a core issue with WWE when we talk about wrestling with the devil. When I think of devil, I think of Vince McMahon and WWE, to be honest. I, I really think that we need to have a, 
a union, every time there's been a union uh, effort, those people have been blackballed and let go. Uh, if anyone says anything that WWE or Vince McMahon doesn't like, they're also blackballed. You know, they they put this, even the older guys, you know, that have the legends uh, contracts, you know, they're threatened and they're not allowed to take part in different um, events. And so I think there needs to be a collective bargaining agreement. There needs to be uh, something where the power isn't just 100% in the hands of the WWE because in their eyes, these guys are just cattle. They don't, you know, they're just uh, a way to make money. And it's only a few, a certain few that get that huge contract, you know. That yeah, star. it's just the top 5% or so. Ben I mean, was one of those guys. He got that mm -hmm. contract. Yes, um, but the they don't want to help the young. They don't want to help the guys that are that are the smaller guys, the guys that haven't been able to make it. That, that's what's going to take is the the guys that have made it to that highest level be willing to stand up for the little guy. And uh, WWE, when they put Kurt Angle into the Hall of Fame, they accidentally mm -hmm. put him in there, but they distanced his face. Uh, <laughs> with angle. Uh, yeah. So, you know, they, they're aware of it, but you know, I've been through, my family has been through this with certain people that with the company that affected my brother's life mm. uh, and they do the same thing. Uh, yeah. It, it's, it's just a matter of what, things. yeah, it's, it's horrible. It's everything is um, whenever something happens, you know, they, you know, they, they have the money to have a, they have the best lawyers, you know, they try to sweep everything under the rug is what they do. It's hard to fight uh, a power as that, especially when they have so much influence within the Justice Department, within the United States government itself. And, and you think about the fact that they have, you know, they're a billion dollar corporation. How much money does it take to set to the side? You know, of it's course. just like all these organizations, whether it's the UFC or, or mm -hmm. NFL, baseball, they're all you know, they make this huge money and, and they let these guys just flap in the wind out here. And exactly. This the, and this, but this is the wor a worst case scenario because somebody was murdered here. And yes, exactly. And a wrestler that had severe uh, brain damage was allowed to wrestle every night over and over. Yes. But once again, Vince McMahon knows everything that goes on in his corporation. I'm sure he knew about this too. Uh, but that's that. And people, thank you so much. I want to, uh, under here, I've been putting the please sub to this channel if you have not, because we have a lot more good stuff and some really good interviews coming out. And I also want to put up, uh, I have another channel too, and uh, it's uh, getting pop more popular by the day. And we're just about to hit 10,000 subs there. And if you want to sub there, I'd really appreciate it. And um, my other channel, it's called the uh, Lee Cole Danny Trio Podcast. It's a mafia slash crime type of uh, channel. And uh, today, this is going along those lines, too. So if you haven't subbed there, please sub there. You're going to see us around. We're going to be doing a, I think we're going to be doing a live show this Saturday for the first time for this uh, wrestling program. What do you think, James? Are you up to it? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, I think it'd be great to, you know, may do a Q&A or whatever. Yeah, we're going to do a Q and A. You guys can come in. Uh, so please, we'll we'll uh, announce it on this channel. I'll put up a short video of when it's going to be. Uh, or my other channel, I'll be having it in the uh, on the community page. Um, so we're really looking forward to doing that. You know, a live will be fun. We I did a live recently on uh, talking to a lot of people about about wrestling on Angel Gotti's channel. And it was amazing to me, James, how many people were in the chat asking questions about wrestling. Uh, it was like a Q and A yeah. for an hour there. Hmm. Yeah. No, that's really cool. Really. So cool. we're looking. You guys come questions. Uh, as long as you come in respectful, we'll respect you. If you come in not respectful, then you know we'll just block you. <laughs> so you know yeah. it's that simple. Um, yeah. And we'll probably most lo likely be looking for some. Uh, wrenches uh that moderators in our subs people that we could trust to uh, help us with our chat room so if you're interested uh let us know 
And uh, you can reach me at LeeCole1010 at gmail.com. That's LeeCole1010 at gmail.com. James, is there a way they could reach you? Yeah, so they could reach me at jproctor70 at gmail.com. Send us good gmails. Send us good emails, okay? <laughs> but anyway, James, thank you so much. This has been a great show. I really enjoyed doing this. I thought we were going to do it about 30 minutes, 35. Yeah, but thank you. I appreciate it. And there's so much. Hey, guys, we could stay here and talk about, about Chris Benoit, who was a wrestling legend. He was a legend, whether people like it or not. And from his career, we just tried to try to get as little as we could in 50 minutes. Uh, so please, uh, like the video. We really appreciate it. James, hang around. I'm just going to get out of here now. Everybody, sub, like. Hit the reminder button so you know when we're coming on live. We're going to be yeah. probably doing one live a week and uh, just on the wrestling show. Take care, people.